Check one, two, check one, two, three. Hi, Ross. Ross, can you hear me? Good. Do you want to try loading up? Uh, I just have to allow you, actually. Yeah. Uh, Graham, are you, am I coming through on sound now? Yeah, that, I can okay. hear you. Sorry, two, <laughs> two buttons to unmute. Um, so so my, my talk slides or my pictures and things are embedded into my video feed. So if you can see them changing over here, then uh, that's, that's yeah. all people need to see. Very good. So how do you go into full screen mode then? Uh, you just have to make, uh, you just have to make my picture full screen. So we have to I ask think. everybody to do that, huh? Uh, yeah, I think if you if you make me present to a host or something, right corner. So, Graham, if you click in the top right corner of your screen, it gives you the option to view, and one of the options is full screen. Full screen, okay. Hello, Tobacco. Nice to see you. Or, or not Can see you, you as the case, maybe. <laughs> It's just a voice kind of uh, a presence. Ah, it's like it's like the voice of God. The lecture, us. <laughs> and then uh, I can make you a presenter, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Should I make make co-host? Is that co-host should work? Yeah. We'll start in about a minute, Ross.
Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, welcome to uh, this week's Department of Medicine 4 p.m. meeting. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, Ross Hoffman, who has agreed to step in at short notice to present this afternoon. Um, Ross is well known to our whole department. He's an associate professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at UCT in Khrushchev. Um, and Russ's interests, uh, clinical and research interests, are in airway management, and he's, he's really known as a national expert in that field, um, both clinically and in the training that he's done. Uh, cardiothoracic and anesthetics, trauma and emergency anesthesia, uh, pre-hospital uh, issues, as well as wilderness and uh, expedition medicine uh, and extreme physiology. And, and Russ has really got a a fantastic reputation for the training that he's done in, in many of those fields in addition to his research. Uh, so Ross is going to be speaking to us today on airway management in emergencies and um, at intubation and airway rescue for the infrequent operator. So very well tailored uh, to the members of our department. Uh, so over to you, Ross, and um, maybe we can just ensure that everybody's kind of got the technical setup. So you're going to share your, you're gonna be the main presenter and then they have to put you on full screen mode uh, to, to see your presentation. Um, yeah. So Russ, I think you want to uh, sort of take over from here. Thanks, thanks very much, Graham, and thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, folks, so I don't have a slide set to share with you. The, uh, the pictures in my talk are gonna come up in my video feed. So if you uh, go to the top right-hand corner of your screen and, and click on the little view box uh, and you select speaker view, then hopefully I will come up more or less uh, full screen and uh, you get to see my smiling mug. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll try and show you some things as we go along. Ross, so, so I'd be worth just uh, sort of five minutes in giving people a reminder again, because we might have people joining a bit late. So, okay. so five minutes into the talk, just remind people how to, or those that have newly arrived, how to, to see you on full screen mode. Yeah. Okay, cool beans. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I shall have to remember to, to occasionally remind people of the slowly shifting state. Uh, I'm used to sh shifting states very, very rapidly. Somebody at a conference recently said, you know, anaesthetists are just like physicians in pajamas uh, with a short attention span. But if we want to change the blood pressure, we change the blood pressure. Um, that, that probably suits my, my particular interest in the emergency field. So yeah, Graham has, uh, has asked me to chat today and just give some points on emergency airway management uh, and particularly for people who are not doing airway management every day. Now, this is very much our bread and butter and this is uh, kind of my, uh, as we said, research and, uh, and, and clinical interest. Uh, but if you're not doing it very often, it is a bit nerve wracking and uh, things can quite rapidly go wrong. And particularly now with the, the looming COVID waves that we've had, and a lot of people who are not familiar with doing air management on a regular basis, managing airways, uh, I think it's great for us to be able to revisit this topic. Uh, and we've had a lot of interaction with teams and groups and individuals uh, who have been somewhat out of their comfort zone. Uh, and so to build a bit of comfort zone uh, for, for everybody. Uh, let's see if I can advance my slides. There we go. So yeah, if you don't know me, hi, I'm Ross. I'm from anesthesia and perioperative medicine. See, it says there medicine uh, in the title. Uh, so that's promising. Uh, and that's my email address. It's uh, 1F and 1E in Hofmeyer, but you're very welcome to reach out to me via email if you've got questions uh, or uh, hit them up in the chat box and I will, uh, um, I'll try and glance at it every now and then and address them as we go, or we can have some discussion at the end. So the composer and musician and um, conductor, Leonard Bernstein said, to achieve great things, we need uh, a plan and not quite enough time. So Graham's given me 20 minutes, he said, although I see the program shows an hour. Uh, so I have not quite enough time to manage the entire field of emergency airway management, but I do have a plan. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, an analogy for what we're gonna talk about is that it's important to, uh, to have a plan uh, both in the emergency situation, but also to prepare for the emergency situation so that when you find yourself with not quite enough time that you have something to fall on. So, 
I am going to basically address nine key concepts of what I think are the most important things about airway management, particularly in emergency and particularly outside of the context of the operating theater and routine emergency, uh, routine airway management, et cetera. Uh, this is a little bit of a, of a bend or a leftwards turn on the traditional seven Ps of intubation, which I think we've kind of moved past a bit, but I've stuck to Ps because it's a nice theory and I've got nine concepts uh, that I, I want to bring across. And if you can do these nine things, then you are gonna be okay. Uh, and your patient's probably gonna be okay too. So the nine things that I wanna bring across in 20 minutes are protection, preparation, positioning, pre-oxygenation, the plan, performing uh, airway management, progressing through airway management, particularly when you encounter difficulty, positively identifying we've got our tube or our airway device in the correct place, and then some post-intubation care. So nine concepts, uh, 19 minutes left, let's go. So the first thing that we need to talk about because we're in the context of the COVID pandemic is protecting uh, the team. And we spent a lot of time on this and a lot of time training, a lot of time writing protocols, uh, and a lot of time in the last, what, 14 months, uh, 15 months doing this. Uh, and I think we need to reflect on what we've gotten right and where uh, we have evolved with the, with the information. So here's a member of one of uh, my teams giving actually an obstetric anesthetic. Uh, and you can see she's wearing some reasonably advanced respiratory protection. She's got eye protection. Um, and you know, there's, there's uh, some scrubs that we can, we can doff there, but there's also a fair amount of unprotected skin. And we've got to ask ourselves, you know, what are we protecting and what are we doing? And when all of this kicked off and we saw the COVID pandemic coming, we really didn't know what was coming. And a lot of our thinking was based on earlier pandemics and particularly the other SARS, uh, the original SARS, SARS Mark I. Um, and the, the meat analysis or really the, uh, sorry, systematic review rather, uh, that a lot of our thinking was based on was this paper by uh, Kai Tran. And I'm sure many, if not all of you have seen or read this by now. And they showed that healthcare workers who were doing the so-called aerosol generating procedures, so things like intubation, bronchoscopy, suctioning, et cetera, were at a much higher uh, risk of transmission of SARS-1. Uh, SARS uh, and they showed, for instance, an odds ratio of 6.6 uh, for transmission of the virus to the healthcare worker if you were performing intubations. And so we based a lot of our thinking about this. Well, we're getting right up in patients' airways. We're doing these procedures, which, which you know, are going to generate coughs and might generate aerosols. And so we must protect people really well. And so we went in hard with N95 masks. And if you were doing an aerosol generating procedure, then you had to wear this PPE. And if you're working the ward, then you had to wear that PPE. And it made sense. Uh, and also in the context of going into the pandemic with global and local shortages of PPE, uh, you know, this, this was a strategy that we employed to try and keep as many people safe as we could. However, we have to acknowledge that the evidence has been shifting and changing. And, and this is a really great paper from Wilson and his colleagues, uh, which is published this year in Anesthesia. Uh, and they looked at using a very uh, nice experimental model with a particular counter and people exercising and breathing normally, and then using various uh, um, non-invasive respiratory interventions. They looked at aerosol particle generation, and they actually showed that patients who are, who are exercising, breathing rapidly, coughing, uh, or even shouting and singing, uh, actually generated more aerosols in their immediate environment than patients on respiratory therapy, which we would originally have thought could have been a problem, such as high flow nasal oxygenation. Now, this is not the only evidence on this. We've seen other papers suggesting that, uh, that HIFNO might be uh, a less of a risk than we thought. Uh, and so what we've got to recognize, actually, a lot of what's happening around our patients is in fact- Oh, I've got some extra extra sound in the background. That's quite exciting. Uh, and what we consider to be very high risk procedures initially, uh, such as intubation, may not be higher risk. Does it have a risk? Yes, I certainly think so. And if we look at other studies like the Intubate COVID study, showed about a, an 11% composite uh, transmission rate for healthcare workers who are performing intubations. But again, is it about the intubation or is it about working in that clinical area? Further studies have shown that, uh, in fact, anesthetists and intensivists seem to be at lower risk of uh, transmission of the illness than uh, healthcare workers working in ward environments. And the likelihood is that we've probably been giving the, the wrong message or we've, in, we've had a, a law of unintended consequences. We focused on AGPs and protecting people during these high risk procedures. What we've got is we've got 
very well protected uh, individuals doing high risk procedures, but we're not taking good enough care of the individuals who are doing the routine standard care and probably all of our patients on the wards in the hallway in the clinic are producing aerosols all the time and we should be protecting everybody. So uh, I, I'm not saying that we had it wrong by saying we should protect our teams who are doing intubations and airway management, but I think that our teams doing those procedures should be protected because everybody is protected already. Fortunately, we've also moved through a lot of the shortages. We also have devices like reusable respirators and so forth. And so we should be providing protection for everybody in all of these settings. Does the level of protection make a difference? Well, there is, uh, there's, no, I can't call it anecdotal, but there is suggestive evidence to say that level makes a difference. This paper, uh, to which I was a co-author, looked at infection rates in healthcare workers in different settings and classified um, the uh, protective equipment according to different levels and clearly showed that there was an association of less transmission with higher levels of, uh, of PPE and particularly respiratory protection. So protection does make a difference but we should have a, an across the board level that we believe is satisfactory. And I think we've actually moved into that, into that position now when working on the wards, when we're working in the operating theater on a routine basis, it's you know, uh, um, N95 or, or equivalent respiratory protection for just about everybody. So that's, that's where we are at the moment with our thinking around, um, around PPE and around protecting the team that everybody should be protected all the time. So point one, protection. Point number two, preparation. Now, we can think about this preparation as how do I get my equipment and my patient ready for uh, airway management for an intubation, but I actually want to zoom right out and I want to take a bigger picture on preparation for a second and think that this must actually be starting where we are right now, talking about airway management, discussing how we're going to do it, thinking about how we're going to apply it in our units, giving people training, organizing equipment, protocolizing, uh, and then taking that into a practice environment, whether it's just learning part tasks in a sim lab, and any of you is welcome to come down to anesthesia and intubate the dolls in my little cupboard sized skills lab, but also perhaps taking the training into the clinical environment. And I think we were quite successful in doing this, particularly in the lead up to the first wave. Uh, the, the staffing challenges have, have uh, thwarted us a bit as we move forward with the pandemic, but we were very good initially about being able to get teams in situ into the wards, into the emergency unit, into the operating theaters, taking a mannequin with us uh, and doing these simulations using uh, conglomerate teams, breaking down the silos and working together. And I think that stood us, that put us in a much stronger position when we started uh, than we would have been. And we mustn't lose that focus, particularly those of us who are kind of part of the furniture, who are entrenched where we're working, mustn't forget that we've got junior staff, we've got new staff, we've got rotating staff moving around all the time. And we need to be thinking about trying to do this as regularly and it's ongoing as we, as we possibly can. So big uh, I view preparation actually starts with, uh, with training. The next thing about uh, a preparation is that we know that in these unfamiliar or infrequent situations, we perform better when we have a benchmark or we have a checklist or we have a protocol to work with. And very successfully for us with the ad hoc teams and the three o'clock in the morning team pulling in a, a dermatology registrar I'd never met before, having proceduralized checklists that make sure we can work through stuff sequentially and we don't forget things, and that everybody knows what their roles and responsibilities are has really made us safer and made us uh, work a lot better. It's not hard to do this uh, for the clinical situation that you're in, but it needs preferably to be done in advance. It then needs to be part of that simulation training, uh, and it then needs to be iteratively improved. If you pick up a problem on a regular basis with your standard emergency intubation or resuscitation checklist uh, on, or, or algorithm, whatever you want to use, whatever you want to call it, then you, you talk about it, you debrief it, you fix it, and you train it again, and you iteratively improve it. Uh, so, of course, one can certainly use the procedure checklist like the one I'm showing here, which was our COVID uh, intubation checklist, or we can streamline this for a particular uh, um, clinical environment. And I think that's important. What is good is to try and protocolize the elements to be the same with minor variations across the entire uh, um, hospital environment as far as we possibly can. Yes, we should individualize treatment, but there are certain things that no matter where you're intubating a patient, pre-oxygenation is always given the list, for instance. Right. So then zooming in a little bit more closely and talking about individual preparation for an intubation, I am a, I'm a huge fan of uh, the, the kit dump 
Uh, or alternatively, uh, if you haven't, if you're not using something like a formal kit lamp or a checklist, the mental rehearsal that allows you also to tick off equipment. So we don't use this here, but I think this is a, a really, really nice concept uh, that I've got up on the screen now. Uh, this is a this is a, literally a sheet that gets unfolded onto the surface. Uh, where people are preparing for an emergency intubation. Uh, this particular one comes from a pre-hospital team and they literally lay out their equipment on top of these spaces and to make sure that when before they're ready to go, every single item is laid out. And what they've done, which is also really clever, and this speaks to the plan uh, point that we're gonna come to in a moment, is they have actually categorized or color-coded their different uh, parts of their plan. So. The, in the blue on the far left, you can see their pre-oxygenation equipment. They're using yeah, a peep valve and an ambu bag, much like we've been doing for COVID. They've got oral and nasal airways uh, and the suction catheter ready to remind them that their suction must be up and going. And they've got a couple of spots to remind them about checking things like the end tidal CO2. Then they've got their primary plan, which is to go for an intubation. They've already asked the question about whether or not they're going to use an alternative strategy if the airway looks difficult. And then they've got their rescue plan, which is the same as the one that we've been training very broadly, which is using a superglottic airway. In fact, they're using the same one that we've used, which is an eye gel. And then they've got their, their front of neck rescue plan, which is further down the line, which is going to be their surgical airway. Uh, and then Importantly, again, for the communication, much like in our checklist, they've got a challenge response checklist to go through as they are preparing for this. So a very nice concept. They have got their plans and their kit dump uh, all bundled into, uh, in, into one uh, layout. So I like that a lot. What can you do if you uh, don't necessarily have these fancy things to, to lay out next to the patient? Well, you can pack out the equipment and then I run through a very brief mental rehearsal of what I'm going to do. And I literally stand there for a moment and I go, okay, I'm going to have face mask on. I'm going to have it connected to the bag. It's going to be connected to the oxygen. Uh, if I'm going to struggle with mask ventilation down the line, I'm going to need an oropharyngeal airway. Can I see that? Right. Then I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to pick up the laryngoscope. Is that here? Is it all ready to go? I'm going to take my tube, which is preloaded with a bougie. Uh, I'm going to perform laryngoscope. I'm going to put it in. Then I'm going to need to inflate the cuff. Oh, where's my syringe to infect the cut? Right, there's one over there, got that. And so I mentally rehearse myself through my plan. And as I'm doing it, I'm double checking my, my equipment. Even better is if you mentally do that rehearsal while you are talking to your team, because then you're sharing the mental model. Everybody is on the same page. And people can go, oh, hang on a moment. You've said that your rescue plan here is a superglottic, but you do know this patient has got Christmas and we cannot open the mouth. Right, plan to change the plan. Okay, so. Uh, getting the equipment out, getting it checked, and uh, if necessary, using rehearsal or a checklist is very, very powerful. The other thing which uh, I, I would encourage people to do is to make sure that their setup uh, is beautifully done. And I, I use this fantastic graphic, which was made by uh, Graham. In fact, we've now used this in a, in a publication. Uh, and, and this is the layout around a patient for a COVID intubation. But actually, how fantastic would it be if we could get this kind of layout and setup uh, for every emergency intubation on the ward. All of the equipment is listed here. Uh, we, we're using the HIFNO. We've got the equipment check there. We've got the drug check. We've even got the paperwork. We've got the emergency equipment on the trolley. Uh, the, there's a reminder about setting up the ventilator. There's a reminder about the suction. There's a reminder about the transport monitor that's connected. You can even see that the patient is ramped. That's the position we're gonna come to in a moment. This is, this is gold. Uh, and so if we can do this kind of preparation every time, then we are preparing for success, not preparing to get caught out. Uh, I have to talk briefly about, about drugs if we're going to talk about preparation. And certainly with the uh, anesthetic uh, COVID intubation team or when we respond to an emergency situation, we very frequently will tailor our drug approach to the patient. And I think we realized that for the infrequent operators and the infrequent teams, unless this is a particular area of expertise for you, then actually standardizing on some simple protocols that you can remember, or just even a list that you can keep on your phone somewhere that you can check and refer to quickly is very, very powerful. And we've kind of standardized on saying to everybody, right, 0.2 to 0.3 uh, milligrams per kilogram of uh, Tomidate for your induction dose, 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilo of rocuronium or sucks, depending on the, the patient's uh, uh, renal function of potassium for your paralytic. Uh, if you're going to give pre-induction fentanyl, you're going to give one to two mics of fentanyl pre-induction. Uh, and then for your post-intubation care, you are going to use morphine uh, around about 0.1 milligrams a kilo that you're going to titrate in, and you're going to use then rock uranium or cisatricurium. I think we've actually just standardized on rock for your post-intubation paralysis. 
established post-intubation sedation and the patient gets transferred. So we've tried to, to streamline it as much as possible. Uh, and <clears throat> importantly, recognizing that we as anesthetists love propofol and we work with it all the time. And it's a brilliant agent in the non-emergency patient in the operating theater. But for any patient who is hypovolemic, shocked, has got cardiac disease or anything else, uh, it's basically, um, that's the white horse upon which death rides. Uh, so it's not a great drug for the emergency, the intub emergency intubation. A better second choice, if you haven't got etomidate, it actually would certainly be, uh, be ketamine. Right. Enough about positioning. I hope I'm doing okay for time so far. And if you've just joined us, don't forget to make my window uh, full screen so that you can see the pictures coming up nicely. So the next absolute point of full uh, intubation success, and, and I cannot hammer home how strongly I feel that this is really important, is really good patient positioning, right? Uh, many of us have been raised on, on these three axes of the airway, and you have to get the axes straight. And actually, um, it's, it's rubbish. Nature doesn't really like straight lines. Nature loves curves. And there's some great work by a guy by the name of Ken Greenland. You can read it in the BJA. I think it's circa 2010, uh, where he took MRI scans and plotted out the curvatures of the airway. And basically showed, as you can see in this picture over here, that the airway has two uh, curves, a primary and a secondary curve. The primary curve takes you from the opening of the mouth around the tongue and to what he calls the laryngeal vestibule, that area of the larynx around the epiglottis. And then there's a secondary curvature, which is an apposition in the opposite direction, which takes you from the larynx down into the trachea. I'm pretty sure all of us have been in the situation of trying to do laryngoscopy and not being able to see the vocal cords. That's a primary curve problem. You are struggling to get a view to pass your tube down. Many people will have been in the position of being able to get a good view of the vocal cords and just not being able to get the tube to advance. And that is a secondary curvature problem. And frequently, we solve the primary curvature problem by extending the head and neck. And yes, Atlanto-occipital extension flattens out that primary curve, uh, as one can actually see quite nicely in this picture. The green curve there has been flattened out with Atlanto-occipital extension. However, if you also extend the cervical spine, you accentuate the secondary curve and it gets very hard to pass your tube. So what we need is cervical flexion with atlanto-occipital extension. And the moment I do that, many of you will realize that this is the sniffing position of which we, we speak all the time. Uh, it's important that it's not a position of hyperextension. It's, uh, it is flextension, cervical flexion with atlanto-occipital extension. In most normal sized adults, we can achieve this really well with one smallish pillow underneath their head uh, and just then a head tilt chin lift to bring the, the plane of the face uh, in line with the, with the ceiling or in line with the horizontal plane. In our larger patients, and certainly with COVID, this has been a common experience. Uh, these patients, if you want to get them in a extended position, you need to actually ramp them a little bit, which means you need to get something underneath the shoulders as well as more under the head and neck in order to get them to this position. And a really nice way to know that you've achieved the extension is to see that your external auditory meatus or your, your ear is in line with your sternal notch in a horizontal plane. And then that the face with a bit of a chin lift is in the horizontal plane as well. And this is a very nice uh, picture illustration of exactly that. If you get this right, your intubations are so much easier. And I can illustrate this even with a simple mannequin in, in the lab. It makes a really big difference. So maybe if you take one, oh no, please take two things away uh, from this presentation. Number one is going to be positioning. And number two is going to be the value of taking that extra moment for pre-oxygenation. Oh, look, let's talk about pre-oxygenation. Okay, so you should all be very, very familiar with graph that looks like this, uh, which of course is a spirograph where we're plotting lung volume across time through a couple of respiratory cycles. We can see normal tidal volume breathing, a maximal inspiration, a maximal expiration and return to tidal volume breathing. Uh, I'm fairly certain I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just want to pause for a second and let us all recognize that that functional residual capacity that us and Ethos get quite excited about, uh, which is the sum of your residual and your expiratory reserve volumes, that is at least half, often, uh, um, uh, well, yeah, let's call it, let's call it half uh, of your total lung capacity and easily 2,000, 3,000 milliliters in, a, in an adult human. Now, if you are breathing normal room air and you've got a 2,000 mil FRC, and let's say you are a little bit sick and so you're running at, at two mets, you're a normal sized adult, 
So we'll call you about 70, 75 kilos. So seven mils per kilo will come around somewhere around 500 mils a minute. If you're breathing room air, then 21% of uh, your FRC, I've kind of averaged the number, or I've fudged the number slightly here just for ease of calculation, but about a fifth of that is going to be oxygen. And so you're going to burn that uh, 400 mils of oxygen that you've got uh, in about 48 seconds. That's not a lot of time if you make somebody apneic and they stop breathing to uh, manage the airway, intubate them, connect everything, inflate a cuff and start ventilating. And it's very, very little time. In fact, it's not enough time. If you happen to put the tube accidentally in the esophagus or you're struggling to see, or you haven't preloaded a bougie, et cetera, et cetera. If you take the same patient and you pre-oxygenate them effectively, and let's allow me to fudge for a little bit and say we could get them to 100% uh, in tidal O2, so their alveolar space is completely denitrogenated, that would give you four minutes of intubation time, which is enough time to try intubate, struggle, try again, struggle, put in a supraglottic, struggle, recite the supraglottic, struggle, call an anesthetist, have them run down the stairs, make them a cup of tea, do a surgical airway while they do the Sudoku and the patient is fine, right? Uh, a little bit of hyperbole, but I think you get the point. I'd far rather have 40, uh, four minutes than 48 seconds. So pre oxygenation is enormously our friend. Uh, how do we achieve this in our sick patient who might be crashing or might have quite significant respiratory distress? Well, Good news is if they're on HIFNO, then actually they're getting really quite nicely pre-oxygenated. We usually have them on 100% O2, there's no high flow rates, that gives them some nice uh, PEEP or CPAP, uh, and often they are very close to breathing uh, uh, pure oxygen when they're doing that. If you think that they need some support or if their level of consciousness is decreased, or if they're not breathing adequately and you want to add some face mask ventilation, by all means, take your bag. And here's a great example of people doing face mask assisted ventilation. You can see that the first practitioner uh, who's standing at the head is actually using both hands to get a seal. Uh, if this patient is unconscious, they're doing a nice jaw thrust. They're sealing the mask on the face and lifting the face into the mask. You can see the ear to sternal notch position that's been achieved there. And actually they've got the second operator who is gently squeezing the bag. I of course would like to see them wearing some gloves. Uh, and I would of course like to see a peep valve on there that can provide a little bit of a positive end expiratory pressure. If the patient's on HIFNO and you'd like to keep them with that oxygenation, you can by all means apply your mask on top of the HIFNO. Usually you won't get a great seal, but it'll be enough of a seal to add some extra PEEP. And of course the extra flow can vent, uh, can vent by the bag. If you haven't got high flow nasal cannulae, you can do what we call a poor man's thrive, which is applying normal nasal prongs or keeping the patient their normal nasal prongs and actually putting the face mask over it. So that's also an option that is before you. Then when it comes to uh, the plan, the, I think it is absolutely essential that we get everybody on the same page and that we know where we're going. And we've built it now into our practice that it's not just, well, there is a plan, that the plan actually gets verbalized. And the time that this happens is while the pre-oxygenation is on. We need two or three minutes um, or at least eight vital capacity breaths couple of minutes is best. So while that pre-oxygenation is happening, we actually talk through the plan. And our, for instance, our standard uh, ward emergency plan is going to be right. Uh, we are going to give the induction dose. We're going to give the paralytic dose uh, after X amount of time or when or the patient fasciculates, then I'm going to take the face mask off. I'm going to do laryngoscopy and I'm going to intubate. I'm going to ask you to inflate the cuff for me. Uh, I've got a preloaded bougie in my endotracheal tube. Uh, if I I fail my intubation or if I'm struggling, then I'm going to revert to my plan B. I'm going to put in a supraglottic airway. Have we got the right size? Yeah, size four, that's great. Uh, and we're going to oxygenate through that. If that fails, I'm going to revert to my plan C, which depending on the setting might be to go direct to front of neck. It might be to revert to mask ventilation. Uh, and so we talk through the plan and make sure that everybody is on the same page before we go. Critically important, that everybody knows what the steps are and everyone has the opportunity to chime in uh, if there's something missing or if they think that there's a problem with that plan. Again, the reason why I like this particular kit dump that actually color codes and includes the plans as well. Right, the next of our important steps is to actually go ahead and perform your airway management or in this context, your intubation. It's fantastic if you've got somebody with that checklist or that algorithm standing there and, and calling out the steps as people go. And certainly this has worked very well for us in our COVID teams. Uh, if you've talked through the plan, then everybody knows what's going to happen. And the person who is the primary leader or the doing the airway management can actually talk through it. Right, I'm doing laryngoscopy. 
I've got a grade two view, but I think I can see you. Let's put it in with a bougie. That looks like it went through. Cut up, please. They're sharing the model. They're talking all the way. Now, performance is important. You need to get it right. But a huge stumbling block in our airway management is that we decide to intubate a patient. And so everything becomes just about the intubation. And even if we're struggling and the patient's desaturating, the patient's becoming bradycardic, Doves has arrived, they're trying to put them in a body bag. Everyone is still focusing on just the intubation. We must not forget that when we get stuck or when it's not working, we have to progress through the algorithms. And we have to recognize that airway rescue is there for an important point. And that is, if what you're doing is not working, then continuing doing what you're doing is unlikely to work. It's going to give you diminishing returns to have attempt after attempt after attempt at laryngoscopy. We know in the emergency context, first pass success, depending on who's doing it, is usually around uh, 85%. Your second intubation attempt gives you between about another 5 and 10% success rate. And that's often because you recognize there's an optimizable factor, such as oh, I needed a bougie, or let me use a video laryngoscope, or can you provide some external laryngeal manipulation to help me see the airway? By the way, you'll recognize those of you who've been doing these and doing training with us, that we've tried to include all those optimizations in our first attempt to have very high first uh, pass success rate. And that's actually been reflected by uh, the numbers and the data coming out of our COVID team, but that's, a, that's another topic, right? So if there's nothing that you can optimize, with, a, with one more attempt, then the right thing to do is to move on. And you don't need to wait for the patient to desaturate uh, and to become bradycardic before you move on to the next thing. So, uh, you know, the, the Difficult Airway Society have encapsulated this really nicely in their algorithm. This is specifically looking at a, an unanticipated difficult airway in the context of, uh, of the operating theater. But they've said here, right, plan A, oxygenate with a face mask, perform tracheal intubation. If you fail, they go straight to a supraglottic airway device, which I think is a very, very sensible plan. SGA is easy to get in. And remember what we're trying to do at this juncture is to oxygenate the patient, hopefully ventilate off some CO2 and to provide some measure of aspiration protection, protection against passive aspiration. And our modern supraglottics with gastric drainage and other things actually do this reasonably well. In the operating theater, you can then say, well, once this SGA is in, I can I can stop, I can wake the patient up if I need to. But actually, and we've had a few cases like this in the COVID pandemic, uh, if the SGA is in and we're oxygenating the patient, even if it's leaking, even if it's not seated, ideally, that gives you time to get more help, uh, to get a friend to run down the stairs to try to do an, a fiber oxygen intubation, or even to continue oxygenating from the top while someone goes ahead and does, does front of neck access, right? Uh, DAS algorithm, you can see here, they go laryngoscopy. If you fail, supraglottic. If that fails, you go back to mask ventilation. If that fails, you go straight to Kaiko, uh, or sorry, front of neck access through a cricothyroidotomy. Uh, different protocols call for different things. I really like uh, uh, Nicholas Crimes' Vortex approach. Uh, if you guys are interested in looking at this, the vortexapproach.org is all free content online, but it's just a different way of thinking of the same concept. So he, he thinks of the... Uh, the, the failing airway as a, as, a, as a funnel. Let's just bring that back up there, right? So you've got this blue funnel with this kind of green plateau around it. We're looking down on it in this image here. So that funnel is much like the thing at the science fair, you put the coin in and it goes around, 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 eventually it drops through the bottom. When you are not able to oxygenate your patient, they are going, they're circling the drain, right? You've got three main options of things that you can do. You can oxygenate them with a face mask, you can intubate them, or you can put in your supraglottic and you can try and oxygenate. Any one of those work, boom, you're back in the green zone, you're safe, and you can call for extra help, or you can think of another plan, et cetera. If you've tried each one of those, or you've tried one of them and it's failing, you either optimize what you're doing, or you move on to the next thing. And you allow yourself one good attempt at optimizing each thing. So if face mask is not working, then I might say, fine, I'll use a nasal airway, I'll use an oral airway, I'll do a better jaw thrust, I'll reposition the patient. If it's still not working, that's done, we're moving to the next thing. And this keeps us progressing through the system. Tried intubating, didn't work. Tried intubating with a, with a uh, video laryngoscope and a bougie and external laryngeal manipulation, didn't work. Intubation is, is finished for today. We're gonna to use something else. We're gonna use a supraglottic, right? So the point I'm making, doesn't matter which one of these systems you use, which one you want to apply, but you must keep progressing through the system. Don't get fixated on, it's all about the tube. Remember that, if something is not working, we need to do the next thing. And if it ultimately means that the next thing that's available, you've gone right around the funnel and you've dropped through the bottom, then that means 
you go through the front of the neck and that, that, that's, that's how it is. Right, so uh, I can put a punt in to say, for some reason people, uh, well, many people have been reticent about the use of supraglottic airways, but go and have a look at uh, the, the AHA's resuscitation guidelines, go and have a look at the pre-hospital guidelines, go and have a look at the airway management literature, and you'll realize very quickly that there is overwhelming groundswell and support for the early use of supraglottic airway devices in failed airways. Yes, they don't offer the, quite the same aspiration protection as a, a endotracheal tube, but aspiration pneumonia is something that can be managed, it can be treated, and the patient can recover from it entirely. Uh, global ischemic uh, and brain damage cannot. So when we get into a failed airway situation, our goal shifts from optimal management of the airway to oxygenation of the patient and just restoring oxygenation. Supraglottic airways, particularly the one we've standardized on for our resuscitations and for our emergency kits, which is the IGEL, they are supremely easy to insert. Uh, and even if they don't seal ideally, they give you oxygenation. So if you are struggling with an intubation or you are failing at an intubation, please go, go progress rapidly to using your, your supraglottic airway. Right. The next important thing is that you think you've got your airway in. Let's say it's your endotracheal tube and you think it's in the right place. We must know that it's in the right place. Certainly for us through the COVID pandemic, where we've introduced a lot more use of video laryngoscopy, this was quite deliberate because to do things like auscultation without self-contaminating, it's very hard to get your stethoscope in and listen without touching all sorts of things. Uh, that's tricky. Whereas if we can have two operators confirm that on the VL, they can see the tube passing through the vocal cords, that's a pretty good positive ID for us. Things that are also good positive IDs is three or five point auscultation. Once the tube is in, can I hear air entry in the left axilla? If you can hear entry in the left axilla, the tube is almost certainly in the trachea. There's a small chance in the left main bronchus. If you can then hear it on the right, it's definitely in the right place. No air entry here. Air entry in the right axilla, that means the tube's down the right main bronchus. Right. And, it's uh, and no air entry here, no air entry here, and over the stomach, tube's in the esophagus. Let's take it out and let's go again. Of course, uh, in the first world, or in, if, if I have to put a plug, if the gold standard, gold standard is we should have waveform capnography at the bedside for every patient that we intubate. If you get a square waveform capograph, you know that your tube is exactly in the right place and that you're getting alveolar gas coming back and so you're giving alveolar oxygenation. We're not quite there yet. Some places in the world, this is where the trend is going. And very important to recognize that if you do have capnography and it's connected and working, if you don't see a capnograph trace, the tube is in the wrong place. Even in cardiac arrest, even in cardiac arrest without CPR, you will get some CO2 on your capnograph if the tube is in the trachea. And if you've got good quality uh, uh, um, CPR, actually watching the capnograph rise is a good way of measuring the quality of your, of your resuscitation. So gold standard would be to have waveform capnography. If you have waveform capnography and you have no waveform, then your tube is in, is in the wrong place. Things that we need to train out of our lexicon is for instance, looking for misting of the tube with ventilation. Uh, the, the stomach can return nice warm gas and mist the tube just as effectively as the, as the trachea. We can use colorimetric devices to check for capnography, uh, but the combination of seeing the tube going in, ideally um, two people witnessing on a VL, using capnography, you have it, and using auscultation, that's a pretty, uh, a pretty solid knowledge that your tube is in the right place. And then we strap it in exactly the place that it should be. Right, so we've got the tube in. Uh, what now? Backslaps and cigars all around, not quite yet. It's time for some post-intubation care. What are the important things to touch on here? Right, so we, we've now oxygenated our patient. We've got an airway in place. We must think of their ongoing ventilation. And this is really where the patient's pathology comes into your thinking and you have to think, how do I want, what are my goals for ventilation? Ideally, we're gonna be doing a lung protective ventilation, uh, but, is this an ARDS? Is this a, 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 a small airways disease? Uh, is this a pneumonia? And adjusting our ventilation uh, to suit that. We obviously, for a patient who is now uh, paralyzed and unconscious and being ventilated, we need continuous monitoring. This should be at bare minimum, uh, continuous saturations and regular blood pressures, hopefully five minutely blood pressures. But ideally, they should be on a cardiac monitor. Ideally, ideally, they should have uh, capnography monitoring as well. Uh, we need to start thinking about are we going to do invasive blood pressure monitoring? So, 
then we have done a very uncomfortable uh, procedure to a patient. They have got a very uncomfortable uh, tube going into the trachea. This is highly stimulating. We must address analgesia. And fortunately, uh, for many patients, an agent as simple and titratable as morphine uh, intravenously is a very good agent. Uh, if you're using your opiates, they have the additional advantage of being anti tussive so it's quite nice. Uh, and we must think about making sure the patient's got adequate analgesia on board before we think about do we need to keep them anesthetized or sedated. So think analgesia first and then sedation. And then frequently we want these patients uh, for transfer, transportation, or just to simplify ventilation. We want them to have neuromuscular blockade on board. The thinking about neuromuscular blockade must come after analgesia, sedation, and then perhaps thinking about paralysis. Right, once we've got the patient well ventilated, being monitored, we're addressing things like fluid and temperature hemostasis. Uh, we have planned our transfer. We know where the patient's going. Then hopefully we can move them to an intensive care environment, or at least we can provide them with the closest approximation of intensive care within our setting. Okay, so, wow, time flies when you're having fun. Nine points that I think you have to address to do this well, and all of us can go and start practicing things immediately. Number one, looking after our staff, think about the protection. Number two, preparation, which we've started right here, and we can take now back to discussing how we will do things in our units, making protocols or borrowing protocols or stealing protocols, uh, and uh, uh, starting to train with them. Number one, return on investment. Uh, when you are going to intubate your patient, please get their positioning good, ear to sternal notch, ramp them, make your life much easier. Pre-oxygenate your patient adequately and use that time while you pre-oxygenate to talk through the plan so that everybody in the team has the mental model. Then go ahead and do that cracking uh, intubation. If you are getting stuck, move on. Don't get into a rut. Don't forbiderate on the same problem. Move on to the next step and think of those algorithms or those cognitive aids as you go. When you've got your airway in, confirm that you're happy where, where it is. There is no shame in an esophageal intubation, but it is catastrophic to have a missed esophageal intubation. So confirm that you know where you are. And then once the dust is starting to settle, think about your post-intubation care and think about if you can't take your patient to ICU, then bring an ICU mindset to your patient. Right, uh, I'm gonna stop there. Whoops, that was the, the flyer ad. Let me take it back to my email address. If anyone wants to drop me a question, uh, otherwise, I'm very happy, time allowing, to, uh, to answer questions now. Great. Thanks so much, Ross. That was a really brilliant talk, uh, you know, packed full of, of pearls and, and really practical, useful information and, and uh, really impressed by your innovative uh, presentation format. Um, it's, it's a first on, on our platform. Um, and, and I just wanted to also take the opportunity to say thank you to you and, and Rowan and Kara and Lindley and, and Jocelyn. And, and all of your team for, for the training that you've been providing for members of our department, um, including some of the, uh, the veterans like myself uh, helping us uh, dust off the cobwebs. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's really been helpful, um, you know, particularly during the second wave, the, the training and the protocols and, and the assistance with the equipment. So to thank you for that. We've, we've got um, about 15 minutes for the questions and I really did want uh, to, to open this up uh, for, for discussion. Um, and I'd encourage people to uh, sort of raise their hands and, and we'll, we'll take questions and discussion. Uh, if people want, they can also type in the chat. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of fire, fire off um, uh, Ross and, and ask the first question, um, just about um, that issue of when, when the intubation um, is, is, is not going, is, is not working. And, and at what point does one decide to sort of, as you say, move along and to move to the, uh, the IGEL? Um, what, what are the, the, the factors that you're looking at? Is it time? Is it what's happening to the patient's oxygen? Uh, is it the likelihood of success? Those sort of things. What, what, what is the thinking about when you move on? Mm. So, <clears throat> This has it, it been the topic of quite a lot of discussion at, at Airway Congresses. And in fact, uh, one of the gurus, like Nick Crimes, who's behind that Vortex approach, did a fascinating exercise at a workshop uh, at, at one of the uh, Euro anesthesia meetings, with about 200 people in the room and had everyone stand against the back wall and then presented a scenario of a patient deteriorating during airway management and had people sort of move forward to stations as they would move forward through the algorithm. And it was fascinating to watch an enormous room of, of anesthetists 
uh, very, very hesitant to actually progress through the algorithm past intubation until the patient was actively desaturating. And for some people, even actually becoming bradycardic from hypoxia before they would take it uh, uh, to, the, to, to the next step. Mm -hmm. I think what, what I try and practice and what I try and uh, um, preach is that particularly with an intubation, if you've gone in to do an intubation and you've encountered some difficulty, it might be that you can't see where you're going. It might be that you just can't get your tube to go in. Uh, you know, whatever difficulty you've encouraged, I actively ask myself, right, can I have another go? And what am I going to do differently with my second go? Have I got a different laryngoscope to pick up? Is it something simple like I was, I, I didn't think or I wasn't on the ball, I didn't use a bougie on my first attempt, or I haven't tried any uh, laryngeal manipulation to try and improve the view, or I haven't tried to position the patient. If I'm going to have a second go, there must be something that I can correct to optimize that. If I feel like I've gone in and my first attempt is my best attempt and there's nothing better that I can do, and there's no person to turn and say, listen, won't you ever go because I'm not seeing anything, uh, then I can move on already. And critically, if, if you're not getting it right, you don't need to wait for your patient to desaturate and for them to become bradycardic before you actually move on to the next thing. If you've, if you've got a trauma patient in front of you or a patient with upper GIT bleed and you go for an intubation and the airway is full of blood and you're suctioning and you can see absolutely nothing, then having blind goes at shoving an endotracheal tube is going to be very, very little chance of success. Then by all means say, right, I'm going to the next step. I'm going to put in the supraglottic. In fact, in that instance uh, where you've got bleeding, which might be coming from elsewhere in the airway or bleeding that's coming from the esophagus, putting in a supraglottic often excludes that from the airway and it often gives you a conduit to, to ventilate through. So I think the threshold that you're asking me about is when will I progress? And uh, I will progress when I cannot improve what I'm doing. Certainly if I've, I don't go past two or three goes at, at something, if there's nothing that I can optimize any further, I'll do the next thing. And that, that's a critical message. And then, Ross, just in terms of the IGEL, I mean, you've spoken about the, the slightly increased risk of, of aspiration and, and um, you know, what, putting that in the context of, of the person becoming hypoxic. Just, you know, in the context of, um, of COVID and, and the great difficulties with, with uh, adequately ventilating and oxygenating these patients, even once you've got them on a ventilator, I mean, do you, do you think one can get the pressures that one needs uh, through the super, supraglottic? I mean, that, that seemed to be a, a trouble with, with at least one that I was involved with. No, you're absolutely right. And this is where uh, if, if I were choosing the ideal supraglottic to use for myself all the time, I would probably trend towards using one of the other uh, second generation supraglottics where they've got a better ceiling pressures and I can often get higher ceiling pressures. Uh, you know, things like the, the LMA Pro Seal, LMA Protector uh, give uh, ceiling pressures of, of 30, 35, even 40 centimeters of water. But the, the downside to that is that they're quite a bit more technically difficult to insert. Uh, they're, they're much harder to get to seat well, where, and you have to get the cuff pressures right, and you have to deal with epiglottic downfolding, which is more common. Uh, whereas something like the IGEL is very, very easy to, to rapidly insert, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's easier to troubleshoot. So we, we made the decision to lean in that direction as a rescue airway because we're cognizant of even if we have to endure a leak, we'll usually be able to oxygenate. If you, if you haven't been able to intubate and you've got no airway, uh, then, then your oxygenation is obviously not going to happen at all. Yeah. So we're willing to tolerate and, and certainly the, one of the ones that I know was rescued in LMA and, and I went to subsequently go and intubate uh, endoscopically. Um, we certainly had a leak on the ventilator and certainly that comes with the risk again of of, uh, of you know, droplets and aerosols being released into the environment. But the important point was that the patient wasn't actually oxygenating any worse than they had been on the high flow. Uh, and the leak fortunately was, was being compensated for by the ventilator uh, and, and the patient had an airway as opposed to uh, you know, not having an airway at all and, and being severely hypoxic. So it, it, is, a, it is a playoff. Uh, but I think that at that point in time, when you when you recognize that intubation has failed, that you then sacrifice a measure of hypoxia in order to have some oxygenation. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
Just want to encourage colleagues. I can't believe nobody's had a, a challenge or a, a difficulty that they want to raise. Um, just, uh, Ross, are you still there? Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay, sorry, my screen had frozen. Um, just, just to um, one one further question from my side. Um, just to, on the issue of, of post intubation, uh, patients who 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 um, drop their their blood pressure and um, an approach to that because that 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 seemed you know in the acute setting to be quite a frequent complication and obviously there are many many reasons uh, that, that 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 happens but but your approach to that um, for, for for you know uh, the, and particularly for the COVID situation yeah sure so uh, a couple of things about that number one one of the factors we recognized quite early back when we saw a lot of patients who were on uh, you know, double barrel oxygen with face masks and nasal prongs, uh, we, we realized we were seeing a lot of patients who were quite dehydrated. And, and I think possibly due to a fair, well, number one, lots of patients harder to nurse, more pressure on staff, maybe they weren't getting IV, uh, you know, IV oral rehydration, but also dry gas through nasal prongs and face masks with, with a very rapid respiratory rate. I think we had a lot of insensible loss. So if there are people who are on the call who are not in places where you've got humidified high flow oxygen, if you're using a double barrel oxygen, think about making sure that you keep your patient's volume replete. Because we saw a few who crashed hard on induction, uh, almost certainly just because they were quite severely hypovolemic from dehydration. Uh, the, the next thing is that our own data, uh, we, we showed it greatly compared to our everyday practice. We showed about a 1% incidence of peri-induction cardiac arrest, um, not necessarily asystole, but, but you know, such low flow cardiac states that uh, one can effectively manage it as a full-blown arrest. Uh, and um, we saw a large proportion become uh, hypotensive post-induction, lots of patients requiring inotrope boluses and quite a, a substantial number Forgive me if I misquote our own data, but I think it was about 15% who we were on inotrope infusions by the time we went to, to ICU. So I think as part of that preparation, it certainly became our standard of, of practice uh, to have dilute uh, ephedrine or adrenaline. And we started moving towards actually having dilute adrenaline uh, um, ready for hand bolusing. Uh, we moved towards arriving at the bedside and actually strongly considering I know some of the intensivists are going to um, glare down their noses at me, but arriving at the bedside and actually giving patients a little bit of a pre-induction fluid load, um, so two, three, 400 mils, um, just to make sure that they were volume replete before that induction. Uh, and then having those inotropes drawn up and ready to go around the induction. And certainly if we're finding we need to give more than one or two uh, boluses uh, of inotropy post-induction, in fact, some we actually needed to, to start inotropes pre-induction, uh, then to switch to an infusion quite rapidly. Uh, and and our, our tendency uh, for these patients is to go directly to an adrenaline infusion. Uh, we as anesthetists use a lot of uh, um, phenylephrine in the operating theater because many of the things that we do uh, and cause alpha blockade. And so, and so you know, giving a pure alpha agonist makes a lot of sense. But these patients actually are in, are in a degree of, of shock and they need some uh, beta effect as well. So uh, um, dilute adrenaline and, and low dose adrenaline infusion is typically really very useful for us in this setting. Uh, and anticipating that a large portion of patients are going to need some inotropy peri-induction. So actually having it ready and having it drawn up makes a lot of sense. Great, yeah. And um, Ross, there's, there's a, a, a question there from Jacques uh, who says, uh, and I think this is even outside the context of COVID that he's talking about, when should a peep valve be used for bag mask ventilation? Should it be standardized for all BMVs in the hospital? Yeah, so actually I was discussing this with some colleagues up country today uh, and, and talking about uh, um, PEEP and uh, physiological PEEP and other factors around it. Uh, so it is, it is normal for us to have a, a small measure of, uh, of, of auto PEEP in our normal respiration uh, and to do many recruitments through yawns and coughs and, and uh, uh, um, even just exhaling against a partially closed glottis. We know that uh, patients who are not breathing spontaneously will rapidly, uh, remarkably rapidly develop atelectasis, particularly in a supine position. And so we routinely ventilate patients with a small degree of, of PEEP. Uh, and it's entirely possible to do that using non-invasive ventilation and using BVMs. I think what's, what's particularly valuable to recognize, and we've seen this with COVID, but also outside of the COVID scenario, 
in any patient who's got respiratory disease, uh, even if it's you know, small airway disease and things like uh, asthma and COAD, where historically we've kind of been anti-PEEP, uh, a small measure of PEEP actually raises our mean airway pressures, it improves our oxygenation, uh, and it, it helps a little bit with alveolar recruitment or just preventing derecruitment. And a particular patient class where some PEEP will help, even for bag mask ventilation, uh, is in patients who are obese. Uh, so should it be a standard across the hospital? I have one hesitation in recommending that it is completely standardized. And that is if, if you are not alert to the fact that you've got PEEP valves, uh, it's very easy for somebody reassembling a BVM to have screwed a PEEP valve all the way in because that feels like the right thing to do when you reassemble it. And suddenly you slap it on and you don't realize that you're giving 15 or 20 centimeters of water PEEP. Uh, but if you do have PEEP valves, uh, and now that everyone is getting quite familiar with their use, it, it's definitely a, a useful intervention for patients who are either obese or have got some respiratory illness. So Ross, I, I learned about a new society today, which is the Difficult Airway Society. I saw you mentioned on your slides. Uh, how does one join the Difficult Airway Society? Um, so you, you, you have to provide evidence uh, that you have been in a situation which has resulted in loss of uh, sphinct. Oh no, actually I'm, I'm making that up. Uh, so the DAS is a, it's a group based in the UK uh, and uh, yeah, quite a large gathering of, of certainly lots of anesthetists, but also ENTs, uh, some pulmonologists, uh, pre-hospital practitioners, uh, and, and they talk and focus and produce guidelines all, of, all about difficult airway management. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be based in the States or you prefer an American uh, accent on your guidelines, there's also the American Society for Airway Management or SAM. Uh, and then there's a European Society of Airway Management. And there's also an International Airway Management uh, Society. Uh, there is as yet not an African Society for Airway Management, but we do have an SA Airway Interest Group, uh, which is mostly active as a WhatsApp group. And if anybody is particularly interested in this stuff, uh, drop me a line and, and add you on there. Um, yeah, DAS, DAS is a nice group of people, quite UK orientated, but we can certainly learn and, and share along with them. Great, thanks, Russ. So, so Russ, you know, just to say once again, thanks for a really brilliant session and, and bringing out some, some really key points. Um, you know, both as we uh, sort of start entering the third wave of COVID and, and start preparing again for uh, intubations of those patients. But I think, you know, the, the lessons that you've shared today are, are, are really more general um, in terms of dealing with, with patients who need airway management and, and ventilatory support. So I think it's, it's really always excellent to have a reminder and, and such an excellent uh, overview of the topics is really appreciated. And just to say to everyone, you know, that th this is an hour-long session. Um, it's it's not meant to take the place of the uh, sort of simulation training uh, that that the colleagues in uh, anesthesiology are uh, offering, and that's on a Tuesday afternoon for th for three hours. Uh, that Project Team Care is offering, and if people are uh, able and, and interested in joining that, um, they can contact Megan Dudley or, or Sahana Ranglal um, to put their names on the list for, for that training. So once again, thanks very much, Ross, and, and really much appreciated. Great pleasure, and thanks for having me. I'll, um, I'll see you at 2 a.m. for the next COVID intubation. <laughs> Hopefully not, the, not tonight, yeah. Not, not tonight, Josephine. <laughs> okay. okay. Goodbye, everybody.